Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm Chris Collins, once again joined by 1st Franklin District State Rep Steve Kulik, part two of our interview on all things Beacon Hill. And we talked a lot of, in the first segment about the pipeline, and I, and I want to go back to that because energy has been a big topic of discussion. The thing about the pipeline that I think has always bothered me, and I don't think we can underscore this enough, Steve, is that once it's done, it can't be undone. I mean, right. we're talking about going through some pristine farmland, violating, you know, centuries-old law, existing state law, mm -hmm. regarding preservation and protection. And the, the whole idea here of those laws is to protect areas like this, to keep them pristine. You know, I've heard someone once say that eventually you're going to have every, every single inch of Massachusetts is either going to be protected or developed. Mm -hmm. And out here... Preservation of these open spaces is a huge part of the quality of life. I don't think that's really been taken into consideration, certainly not by the developers. Do you think the federal government will take that into consideration when they decide whether to approve this thing? I think they will. And one of the things we're encouraging the federal government to do is to look at all of the competing uh, gas pipeline proposals there are. You know, we're mostly concerned in Franklin County about the Northeast Direct Pipeline project of Kinder Morgan. But there are a couple of other uh, which, which fall more under the um, uh, heading of pipeline expansions of existing pipelines. So if the FERC decides, after looking at all of the evidence, including the Attorney General's report that we talked about in the earlier segment, that which basically says we don't need the additional gas capacity, that we, we're encouraging FERC to look at all of these proposals and not allow these competing projects to over, build over capacity, um, which you know it's intended for export outside of Massachusetts. It's not going to benefit us. It's not going to benefit our ratepayers. It's not going to lower our electric bills. Um, it's going to do none of what the company proposes. And we hope they look at it its, at its entirety and therefore do look at the issues of environmental impact closely. You know, that's one of the main things, these scoping sessions that were held in Franklin County earlier uh, in uh, this year, that people were suggesting what the environmental impacts need to be looked at by FERC, including water supply, agricultural lands, jobs in the forestry and agricultural businesses, uh, you name it. Those are all things they have to look at, uh, in addition to do we really need the gas supply. So I think folks have organized well, they've educated. This This is one of the most well-educated, uh, well-informed um, uh, groups of citizens uh, on this subject that I've ever seen. And our local press has done a great job. Um, the recorder in particular has, has really uh, dived into the pipeline issue deeply and just had a consistent set of very comprehensive and well-informed articles um, that people follow. And so I'm hoping that FERC will appreciate the amount of effort and um, informed effort that's going on here. It's, and it's not just a NIMBY not in my backyard. Yeah, it's people much have more, yeah. serious, it's much deeper than that. It's, it's, it's public safety, it's public health, it's property values, it's jobs, it's the environment, it's energy policy for Massachusetts and New England. And uh, it's taking the long view rather than the short view. So um, we can hope, and we're gonna make the strongest arguments we can, that FERC will look at this the right way and make the right decision that we don't need this. I'll tell you what scares me a little bit is, I was at a Conway All Town meeting recently. We covered it for FCAT, and there was a woman there who was speaking, I believe she was a member of the planning board, who said, don't worry, this thing is never gonna happen. This pipeline's never going to happen. And, and I remember hearing that and thinking, well, I mean, you're talking about a, a multi-billion dollar corporation mm -hmm. and the federal government up against a bunch of, of people from rural Western Mass. I mean, talk about a David and Goliath scenario, but there are people in these towns who think this isn't going to happen. We're, we're going to be able to stop this. What happens politically to people like you and Stan Rosenberg and members of the delegation if it does happen despite your best efforts to stop it? Well, if the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission were to approve this project, um, we would insist that conditions be put on this that respond to the, to the many environmental, public health, and safety issues that have been offered in FERC, to FERC through its um, uh, process. And that can happen. Uh, and we would make sure that every single 
avenue that would exist under state law and state procedures, including the Article 97 uh, constitutional protections of um, sensitive environmental lands, protected lands, uh, be honored and be respected and be part of the solution. So, you know, I, I do think it's possible uh, to defeat this project. Um, I think primarily on economic grounds, but also on environmental grounds. And, um, uh, you know, I think we stand a decent chance. Uh, people say, look, FERC has never turned down a pipeline project. That's true. But, again, we have multiple competing pipeline projects. Now, I know there are some folks in the anti-pipeline um, community who are opposed to any expansion of gas in this state whatsoever. Um, they're very troubled, as they should be, by the way this gas is, is um, mined uh, through the fracking process, which creates enormous environmental degradation in the areas where it is um, harvested from, in Pennsylvania in particular. Um, but all gas is fracked. So if we're going to have any gas use in Massachusetts, it's going to be fracked gas. Um, if you're going to have, if, if FERC is going to decide that, yes, Massachusetts can use some incremental increase in gas capacity, then going through uh, one of the other projects in south southeastern Massachusetts or the southern portion of Western Mass that uses existing pipeline capacity uh, rights of way but increases um, the ability of more gas to move through those, that would be a preferable way to go than going through virgin territory and creating all of the problems people talk about in Franklin County. So. There's a lot in the mix there. Um, I continue to be optimistic that with the kind of concerted effort that's going on here, people can defeat this. Is Article 97 the best shot? And by the way, Article 97 is a constitutional provision that says that for environmental law to be repealed, it requires a two-thirds vote of the legislature? That's right. Two-thirds vote in the Senate and two-thirds vote in the House to get both. And I think one of the reasons they altered the pipeline to go through southern New Hampshire was to take Article 97 out of play because there were tons of reps inside that beltway where it was going to yep. go across the northern tier that were going to oppose it and that would have basically taken them out of any hope of getting a two-thirds majority. Yeah, so there's, um, you know, I think frankly uh, we can defeat uh, the removal of Article 97 protections um, on this Sandusfield uh, project if it comes to a vote. Um, the, this is a smaller, called the Connecticut Expansion Project. Kinder Morgan is proposing to go through some really sensitive state-owned conservation land in Sandusfield um, for a project that doesn't even benefit Massachusetts at all. It's all about increasing gas capacity in Connecticut. And so um, I think if that comes to a vote in the legislature, I'm optimistic that we, at least in the House, speaking for House members, that we can defeat it. And then we'll see what happens. Uh, it would probably uh, be challenged in court. I'll tell you, if, if FERC were to approve the NED project, um, irregardless of Article 97, I'm convinced that Massachusetts will take that to court, and it's the kind of case that could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, I'm saying that's what I'm saying. I, yeah. I think that the lawsuit is well filed by the Deerfield abutters. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're talking about a constitutional issue, it could go to the high court, and if it does, it could alter the way what, uh, an eminent domain is done nationwide for Absolutely. energy projects like this. So yep. you could be, you'd be writing constitutional case law right here in Western Mass. It's which true. is somewhat exciting, even though yeah. it's unfortunately under a bad set of circumstances. Absolutely. And, you know, Kinder Morgan keeps saying, oh, we're going to have this in operation by 2018. <laughs> no problem. End of 2018, it's all going to be built in, in operation. Uh, that is very, very wishful thinking. Yeah. When you think of not only the FERC process we're into now, but um, the legal challenges that will fall, sure to follow, yeah. and the number of different legal arguments are being made. And as we've talked about, the financial uh, change in the energy marketplace, which may make this a very uneconomical project for Kinder Morgan to pursue. One of the things you mentioned before that would make this pipeline unnecessary is increased use of renewables. Right now, Massachusetts gets about 1% of its energy thereabouts from solar. The legislature this uh, past session uh, took on the issue of net metering, which is the process by which people who convert to solar are financially remunerated. Uh, and the, the, the goal, I think, is to get that cap lifted so that solar bike could be up to 3%. Now, groups like Environment Massachusetts want 20% mm -hmm. by 2025, which I think is it's ambitious to say the least. I'm not sure it's possible. But talk about you, what you were able to do regarding getting the caps on that metering lifted, which would allow more solar uh, arrays to be constructed. 
So as we sit here in December and talk about this, it's still an unresolved issue in the legislature. Um, there are basically three things in play. Uh, the governor has filed a bill that would increase the cap on solar net metering. Um, the Senate has passed a bill. The House has passed a bill. Um, the House and Senate bills are now going to conference committee. They're in conference committee to be resolved and then a compromise presented to the members of the House and Senate. It needs to happen soon yeah. and I'm hoping that it will because we, people need to have certainty, particularly regarding large scale solar projects. And we see them in our backyard, not in our, literally in our backyards, but in our area. There's a lot of them. Uh, there's a lot of them going up and there are more proposed. There's a big one on the landfill in Montague. Um, we have a project in Sunderland. We have a project in Waitley. There's an existing project in Waitley already. Isn't Deerfield working um, on something too? Deerfield's working on something, absolutely. So um, there's a lot of capacity for larger scale um, community owned or um, commercially developed but on public land uh, with a return to the host community uh, in, in an annual payment or it can also be energy used by the municipality. So um, it's really important to keep these moving. You know, we are the national leader in solar development and the rate of solar development and in job creation in the green economy, in solar energy conservation uh, and so forth. Uh, I think it's 13,000 new jobs have been created uh, in the renewable energy field and we need to maintain that momentum. Unless we increase the caps to a suitable amount and unless we allow community solar projects and virtual net metering, um, which helps people who maybe don't live in an area where they can have solar, but they can participate in the ownership of a solar system somewhere else that feeds into the electrical right. grid. Um, so there are a lot of differences between the House and Senate version. Um, you know, mo most of the components in the Senate version are ones that I like better. Um, I wish we could have done more in the House version, but um, it's in conference now and we'll see what happens. But I think it needs to happen soon in order to reassure the marketplace that aggressive solar development is possible to continue in Massachusetts. There are some environmental groups who say the House didn't go far enough. In fact, Environment Massachusetts called that bill a wolf in sheep's clothing. And then in fact, they wanted much more and they were disappointed. They didn't go farther. I think you kind of share that view a little bit, right? I do. I do. And I think, you know, part of it is the nature of the legislative process that the Senate had already acted um, back in the summer. So, you know, the House is going to do something that is sort of different from what the Senate did. And, and it always works in reverse. If, if the House does something first, then the Senate goes second. They always do things differently so that they resolve it in conference and come up with a compromise. We're also mindful of what is it that Governor Baker is going to support yeah. because we have to put a bill together that not only can pass both the House and Senate, but that the governor will sign. So, you know, it's all three players, House, Senate, Governor, want to get this done. Uh, everyone has a slightly different perspective regarding, you know, protection of the ratepayers or incentives to the solar industry, um, you know, long term uh, return on these investments. And so I think we can meet in the middle somewhere on this. I think we can come up with a good bill and I'm really hopeful we will. You know, we're really lucky that um, really one of the, the very strongest leaders, most knowledgeable leaders in the whole state house on this issue is Senator Ben Downing. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, from Pittsfield, but um, much of his district is in Western Franklin County and he chairs the committee on telecommunications, utilities and energy and he leads the conference committee on the Senate side. So. Um, I think he's going to always have the interests of the kinds of towns we represent at heart as he's at the negotiating table. Well, it's not unusual for you guys to have to slug things out in conference. I mean, no. it, does, it happens every year with the budget. It happens with any major bill, really. But in this particular yeah. case, it, are the differences so severe that it could jeopardize uh, lifting the cap on that meter? No, I don't believe so. I think um, we will lift the cap on net metering. It's a matter of how much, what the degree will be. I think there's agreement we need to do this. Um, I don't think a, a solution is in jeopardy at all. I think we'll be able to reach agreement. You're watching Beacon Hill Update here on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm Chris Collins, being joined by First Franklin District State Rep Steve Kulik. I want to shift gears to uh, another topic that's of major regional concern, and that is, of course, the drug problem, mm -hmm. opioid addiction is really wreaking havoc, not just in Massachusetts, but all across New England. 
And for the first time, it looks like the legislature has put some, some money behind the effort to deal with this. And this is something that the governor especially seems to have taken an intense personal interest in. But Franklin County really was on the cutting edge of this discussion you know, with the, the establishment of the opioid task force. It's been kind of a model, not just here, but across the country. Uh, so what's the next step? After putting forward millions of dollars to try and battle this, what will be the next move? Well, you're absolutely right. Franklin County uh, has been amazing, leading the way. I think we were out ahead of the curve, as you say. And I really give enormous credit to three people in particular, um, our district attorney, Dave Sullivan, our Register of Probate, John Merrigan, and our Sheriff, Chris Donilon. They recognized, I think before most of us did, that there was a crisis happening right under our noses. And they pulled together this task force. They approached us in the legislative delegation and said, we, we need to invest some money and coordinate efforts. We bring together you know, treatment providers, physicians, law enforcement, educators, you know, folks at the local level. Uh, and so we did that a couple of years ago and put some money in the budget specifically for the opioid task force in Franklin County. We're going to continue that. Um, I don't, I'm, that's a priority of all of us in the delegation. Um, and just earlier today, the day we happened to be taping, um, that group and I and Representative Paul Mark and Susanna Whips Lee, we had a meeting with the chair of the um, uh, House Committee on Substance Abuse and Mental Health Issues. Uh, at the Franklin County Jail because she's working on comprehensive legislation right now um, that will be coming up in 2016. Um, the Senate has already passed uh, a bill. The governor has filed a comprehensive bill after a task force had made recommendations. And it was really interesting to, as the House is drafting a bill, to listen to the recommendations of uh, the, the Franklin County folks who you know, have been on the ground with this for a couple of years now. And talking about reaching out to physicians to get them to change their prescribing habits and their, their practices, um, to local law enforcement to be able to respond quickly, uh, to treatment, uh, to education. Uh, all of those things come together in a package that I think people statewide now understand we need to address all of it, and it's gonna cost money. but. Dealing with the problem, it will probably cost less money than if we continue in a crisis mode. Right. Just the individual costs of treating someone with addictions that goes unchecked and unaddressed, where they end up in emergency rooms, where they have other health problems. Um, you know, the, and, and the problem doesn't get any better in terms of the supply of inexpensive heroin in our communities. Yeah. And in many ways, you know, it's not so much a prescription pill problem as it, as it was. It's the cheap heroin that uh, is flooding New England. Uh, and you know, every few days you read about a significant bust, usually some idiot driving through <laughs> Franklin County somewhere with a tail light a out. Busted tail light, and yeah. so they get stopped for that and they find a car full of heroin. So that's great. That's been intercepted and taken off the streets. But how much is getting through? Yeah, you know. And I don't think you can look at this anymore as a law and order issue. And I think that's one of the things that's been refreshing about that's the right. conversation is, it's the focus has gone from being okay, throw these guys in jail to, let's get at the root of why people are do, using this stuff in the first yep. place. And that's where it need, the conversation needs to start. Absolutely. So we need to be talking about um, education in the schools, um, being able to identify students who may at an early age begin to have substance problems um, and to be able to have programs in place that address those. Um, one of the things that the Franklin County Task Force has worked on is uh, a comprehensive um, curriculum at the middle school level um, that seems to be having quite well, a bit of success. Life skills, exactly, right? yeah. the life skills program. And so um, that's going to take money and we're committed at the state level. I think. It was a focal point of our budget for FY16. It's going to be more so in FY17. We will have to coordinate um, investments in the state budget along with recommendations contained and programs contained in a comprehensive opioid bill. And we're going to get to that early in 2016. It's, it's a priority of every legislative leader, um, certainly the governor. and. When I talk to my colleagues in the legislature, there is not a single part of Massachusetts that is not experiencing this. I think the reason it took a little longer for us to recognize the seriousness of it in Franklin County is you tend to think of this as an urban problem. 
Uh, and not it's anymore. Not, not anymore. And in fact, um, so I'm very active in a group of, of national rural legislators. We meet once a year and um, we plan a conference with workshops on hot topics. And as we were planning this year's convention coming up in January, one of the things someone in North Dakota suggested was something about an opi opioid crisis. Asked, if, is anyone else having this problem? And the 20 or 30 people on the phone, yep, we are. So actually our leader, Marisa Hebel, is, is coming out um, to Denver in January to address the conference of national rural legislators about what Franklin County is doing. Because I think we have a lot of examples of success that we can show oh. and, and point out to some of the challenging areas we need to work on. That woman is a force of nature all by herself. She's incredible. We're so fortunate to have her doing this work for us. Um, you, you mentioned education briefly. I want to just touch on something that's been in the news. The governor wants to, if not remove, certainly raise the cap on charter schools. This is one of those situations that could really devastate rural school districts. Mm -hmm. um, where are you on that? I know you're probably not going to be in favor of lifting the cap, but is there any way to stop it at this point? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be on the ballot. Uh, the voters are probably the ones who are going to decide whether or not the charter school cap is lifted, and there can be I think this proposes an additional 12 charter schools per year going on into the future indefinitely, I think. I think there are 85 charter schools in Massachusetts now. They're mostly in urban areas. Um, the charter schools around here that affect us are Four Rivers in Greenfield, the Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Charter School. Uh, those would be the major ones. And there haven't been new charter schools proposed in the Franklin County area for a number of years Not now. Not yet. Not yet, but they could be coming. So. Um, the issue is unlike, because it's heading to the ballot, I think it's unlikely to be addressed in the legislature between now and November of 2016 when the voters will decide. And that is going to be a really pitched battle um, because on the one hand you have the Massachusetts Teachers Association very vehemently anti-charter school and they say they are, they're going to lead a very aggressive and expensive uh, campaign uh, to defeat the expansion of charter schools once and for all. They're, they're actually relishing uh, taking this to the ballot. And then you have uh, usually a business-led um, coalition um, of charter school advocates. And you know, it's really interesting. I, I don't hear from a lot of charter school advocates from my area because it's most, it is mostly an urban yeah. issue in poor urban communities such as Boston, Springfield, Worcester, Lowell, Holyoke. Um, there's a, a you know, a significant number of parents who believe that charter schools is their best way out of underperforming public schools. Um, there's a lot of argument about that. Um, and there are conflicting results of various studies and, and that are done on this subject. But the biggest voice that I hear are from minority parents in the city of Boston yeah. who want more charter schools. It's our capital city. It's the biggest single voting block of voters in the state. I think how this issue plays out in Boston is probably how it's going to play out in the state and affect the rest of well, us. Well, it may be an urban issue, but you don't need a lot of charter schools to pop up here to have a devastating impact on rural schools. No. I mean, just the ones you mentioned alone siphon millions out of local yep. public schools. And let's face it, charter schools are not conventional public schools. They're, they're, they're largely not. private schools funded with public money. And until that changes, mm -hmm. is that something the legislature could do something about? It is. Um, the, the, the financing and governance uh, questions around charter schools are very real. Um, you know, there's no accountability like you get with a school committee. Um, you don't have a public process of adopting a budget. And they don't have to deal with SPED and they don't have to deal with teachers unions. This is true. This is true. I mean, there can be teacher unions at charter schools, but, but I don't think there are any that aren't. There's, they there are not. No. But it, it, they're not prohibited, but they just don't happen. And in terms of SPED, you know, charter schools uh, claim that they, um, they take in special needs students. Um, and to some extent they do, but I don't think to the same percentage of the population no. that the public school does. Because remember, to go to a charter school takes um, a very particular kind of family that is able to provide transportation, provide you know, the kind of support at home that you might need for a more rigorous academic environment. Um, you name it. It's, it's not a cross-section of the typical school-age population and their families. 
So these, these are serious questions we need to look at. We spend a lot of money on charter schools that are co coming out of our local districts. Um, in most of the districts around here, it's over a million dollars a year. I know up in Gilmontague, uh, it is over a million dollars a year. And that is a, a school district that is on the rise, but it's been through some troubling times over the last few years. They could use that money very effectively locally. We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, couple of other issues to talk about. This is an election year coming up. You going to run again? Yes, I am. You are going to run again. Now, I am last running. time around, you had a, a challenge from Dylan Corpita. In fact, we had a, a pretty good debate on this very television station. We did. Lincoln Douglas. Um, you know, you're vice chair of Ways and Means. Are you going to be chair this year, you think? Or? Well, no. Uh, it doesn't work that way necessarily. Okay. It, you know, if there were a vacancy, I'd certainly be interested in it. Um, but that's leadership anyway. You're in the leadership. Yeah, I am in the leadership, and it's a great position to be in as vice chair of Ways and Means. And not only do I get to work intensively on the budget every year, but every capital spending bill, any other major piece of legislation, whether it be solar energy or other energy utility issues, uh, land use issues, they all come through ways and means. So uh, recently I spent a lot of time over the summer and early fall working on public records reform. Yeah, that's a big um, one coming up. That's a big one. And uh, so it's, it's a great job because at Ways and Means because I get to bring a small town rural perspective into major policy issues as well as spending issues. So to look out for the 19 towns in the district. So. Um, you know, I'm really privileged to have that position, really privileged to be elected a number of times to serve this district, and I will be standing for re-election again in 2016. What's the best part about the job? I know it's not the driving. I mean, the only one who probably drives more than you is Paul Mark, yeah. who put like 60,000 miles on his car last year. Yeah. But what's the best part about what you do? Solving problems, uh, trying to help people, um, trying to um, bring the perspective of this end of the state and these types of communities that I represent uh, into issues like charter school debates or energy debates or spending priorities to, to make sure that when we do a big opioid bill uh, that it contains the experience of Franklin County, that small town perspectives and needs are represented in a statewide um, argument that, you know, a solution that very often is more urban oriented, um, to be able to advocate for things like rural broadband. Um, you know, that's what's critical about this job. It's what I love about the job is being able to, you know, advocate and articulate for these particular needs. That's, that's what it's all about. It's listening to people. It's being out in the community. It's getting good ideas, finding out what their problems are, and trying to translate those into action on Beacon Hill. We'll leave it right there. We're very lucky to have you. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate You're it. You're always welcome to come in and talk issues anytime here at FCAT. Uh, happy to do it anytime. The East First Franklin District State Rep Steve Kulik. I'm Chris Collins. That's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.